Welcome to lecture 19 of Network Strands Money and Bytes. Now we are getting towards the end of the course and we have two more lectures left. Now this one we're going to talk about something very practical and we'll try to understand something we have not been able to talk about much in technological networks and that is the overhead associated with managing the internet and wireless networks. And the motivating question is why am I only getting say three or four percent of the cellular speed that sometimes I read in advertisement and commercials. Now, here's a experiment that you can try right now for example if you have any 3G or 4G access. So suppose you try to download a large email attachment okay, for example a PowerPoint of say 10 megabytes so you can try it on your 3G data network and then you stopwatch clock it to see how long it takes then you just divide 10 mega times 8 that will be a number of bits uh, by the number of seconds that it took and you calculate the speed of downloading this PowerPoint and then you divide that number by the advertised 3G speed I don't know what number you are quoted with in the commercial in your country, but let's say something around uh, hundreds of uh, megabits per second uh, for 4G and um, you know, at least in the tens of megabit second range for 3G. Okay. And I tried this. I tried the, this one uh, the other day and uh, I was actually standing very close to outdoor and in a very uh, high-tech region uh, of the country and I got only 3.7 percent of the advertised speed so the question is who ate my 96 percent okay, I paid for it and why am I getting only 3 4 percent before we answer this question just want to clarify the terminology a little bit we talked back in lecture one, okay, that's a long time ago, at the very beginning of this course, about cellular network standardization's evolution from the first generation to second generation. And in most part of the world today, we're talking about 2.5G or 3G. Although 4G is being rolled out uh, as we speak and in the next three to five years around the world. So 2.5G. Uh, technologies include those such as edge or EVDOs and 3G have two tracks the first track is what's called UMTS or WCDMA the other is called CDMA 2000 and this is done by an industry group called 3GPP this is done by 3GPP2 and 4G is actually even more confusing terminology to most people, 4G means something called long-term uh, evolution, okay, LTE. And there's something called LTE Lite, LTE Advanced, and different releases of LTE. But there are also others who call advanced versions of 3G technologies, such as so-called HSPA Plus, also as 4G. So at this point, uh, the terminology is getting a little confusing and the boundary between 3G and 4G is getting a little blurred because different companies uh, may choose to call different uh, development of the standardization whatever they, they would like to call it. So whatever 3G, 3.5G or 4G you're talking about uh, you never get the best case physical layer speed quoted best case physical layer speed okay. so it's not that you are being uh, cheated by your carrier okay. it's just that the terminology they use sometimes in quoting the speed refers to the best case physical layer speed and what you actually experience is the useful throughput in your application. Now there are two main root causes for the discrepancies between the two. 
Number one is non-ideal network conditions. And this can be associated with things such as the air interface, okay, over the radio link or the air, as well as in the wired network, which could be the backhaul, which could be the data center on the other end, like Google's uh, data center, or it could be somewhere in between over the public IP network. We'll show a picture of that momentarily. The other is overhead. Okay. Just like our lives, overheads take up a big chunk. Sometimes the overhead may take up more than the actual payload. And overheads come in different format. One obvious one is there are headers okay, in front of each layer's packet or frame or segments. Part of that comes from protocol semantics. Okay. We'll see a few uh, and then a few more in advanced material. Part of that is due to control plane. And we'll explain this in more detail soon. These are the signaling messages that control and manage the network. And part of that comes from the need to uh, enable advanced technologies, some enablers of advanced technology. For example, as we mentioned in the advanced material part of the last lecture, something called multiple input, multiple output, MIMO, something called orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, OFDM. These two are powerful physical layer innovations using signal processing and communication techniques for wireless. And they are used in both 4G LTE and Wi-Fi 802.11n. And there are a number of overheads associated with enabling these kind of physical layer technologies as well. Okay. So non-ideal network conditions together with overheads. And you may wonder how much can they take away from my best case physical layer speed? Well, quite a lot. In fact, you should count yourself lucky if you still can get 3.7%. Often these two things can add up to eat over 99% of the best case physical layer speed. So when we talk about the speed, the speed that matters to you, we're really referring to not this one, but the useful throughput that you observe in the application layer. In the physical layer, you can try a variety of techniques, for example, MIMO or FDM to enhance what's called the spectral efficiency. That is, how many bits can you send per second over each hertz of the frequency spectrum? And that translates to some degree into the speed that we care about, but has to go through many layers and many kinds of overheads and non-ideal network conditions. And in the end, by the time it gets to the application that you care about, it may have been reduced substantially. Now, of course, when we say throughput, we mean the number of bits directly used. Okay. Monitoring, management, control overhead, they don't count in the useful throughput that we are defining right now. Okay. The so number of bits directly used in your application, for example, the number of bits that's actually the YouTube video divided by the time that it takes to uh, obtain these. Okay. So if this numerator becomes smaller, the useful throughput drops. Or if this time that it takes becomes longer, then the useful throughput drops. Okay. And we will see both kinds of factors at play. So first of all, let's look at the uh, interface here. Okay. So what kind of interface, uh, air interface issues do we face? There are quite a few. For example, just look at a propagation channel. Okay? Assuming there's no other users sharing the air with you. You are the only one. Still, you have to face path loss. That is, the signal strength drops as the distance of propagation increases. You have to face shadowing, that is, obstruction of the signal by different objects like buildings. And then multipath fading, 
which says that each signal will bounce off of many different objects and is collected at the receiver from multiple paths. Okay. So here is a tower, and uh, you are here. Okay. So just because of the pure distance, there's a path loss. Because of building, there's a shadowing. And then because of different objects, buildings and trees, the signals actually bounce off in different paths. Okay. All three will degrade the kind of signal quality that you can receive. So especially if you are standing at the cell edge away from the base station, blocked by many buildings, you're going to receive a lower rate. Then of course you're not the only one in the cellular network. Okay. Unless in the middle of nowhere and in the middle of the night and you ha so happens to actually still have access to a cell tower. Okay. Most of the time there are other users and they cause interference as we saw. Interference will reduce the received signal interference ratio and we saw you can do power control to help with that but still it is not perfect. Okay. In the end when the SIR drops below a certain threshold then you have to lower the bit rate. Because the channel and the interference is so much, you have to talk slower in order for the intended recipient to correctly decode or understand you. So that's just the air interface. And then there is also the backhaul. We'll see uh, very soon in a slide that the backhaul consists of quite a few components as well. Another way to look at backhaul is to say that it consists of, obviously, links and nodes. Okay. And the links can introduce non-ideal network conditions. For example, congestion. Okay. They happen on the links, and the resulting queuing delay reduces throughput. Longer delay will increase the denominator in the expression of useful throughput, and therefore reduces the useful throughput value. There's also propagation delay. You think this can't hurt too much? Well, we'll see uh, in an example towards the end of this lecture that they can also add up to reduce your throughput. And now, of course, there are nodes. Okay. There are all kinds of nodes. For example, switches and routers. Okay. They can introduce additional delay in their server, uh, in their uh, uh, queues at the router interfaces, for example. And then there are servers, and these servers have their own processing power limitation, okay? Especially if it is not sized properly, then when there are many people demanding the same uh, servers to respond, the server simply cannot respond fast enough because of its computational power limitation. Okay. This happens a lot with a so-called flash crowd with certain popular website servers. That has really nothing to do with the network per se, but nonetheless, uh, it will reduce the useful throughput. So in summary, non-ideal network conditions at the air interface and in the backhaul, as you can see, there are many places where things can go wrong. And then there is also uh, overhead. For example, the overhead associated with the protocols the semantics protocols actually require a certain sequence of exchange of uh, control signals. Okay. And the sequence of message passing uh, takes time and therefore adds to the time that it takes to finish getting the useful bits. Okay. Again, increasing this number. And sometimes they also take extra uh, number of bits and that further reduces the throughput. Okay. Let's take uh, look at a very simple example in TCP. Uh, recall that TCP is a connection-oriented transport layer, layer 4 protocol. And it's the dominant one uh, for the connection-oriented transport service. Now, when we establish an end-to-end -end connection through TCP, we actually go through a handshake procedure. For example, one end host says connect. So this is a control packet. Okay that go through a certain distance, horizontally represented. And they take some time 
to travel through that distance where time is vertically represented in the space-time diagram. And then the other end, B, will then say, all right, I got it, send an acknowledgement back. So that's a two-way handshake, but TCP actually requires a three-way handshake. Then A sends back to B that I acknowledge your acknowledgement. I hear that you hear me. Okay. Why would you want to do that? Well, in this case, then not only does A knows that B is ready to connect, B also knows that A is uh, knows that B is ready to connect. Now, of course, if you want to be really uh, reliable, you can send yet another acknowledgement back, and this can keep on going. But they say, all right, three-way handshake is a good compromise. So this three-way handshake doesn't carry any useful bits. It's purely setting up the end-to-end -end connection. What about at the end of the session? You have to tear down the session. So A may say, I have nothing more to say to you. Okay, finish. And then B acknowledge that and say, I'm done too. Uh, or, or that I know that you are done. Then B sends another signal, finish, that says, I'm done. And then B says, all right, I acknowledge that. This is called a four-way session teardown. And you may wonder, why do I have to do this four-way? First of all, can it just be one way? A says, I'm done, and then you just close it. Well, what if B cannot receive this finish control packet? Right, you want to know that B knows that you are done. Then what about this pair? Well, that's because uh, the fact that A has nothing more to say does not mean B has nothing more to say. This is a duplex uh, session, meaning that A can talk to B, B can talk to A, or in other words, it is a bi-directional link. So A's done doesn't mean B's done. You have to hear that explicitly from B, and therefore another two-way handshake. So altogether, you've got a four-way handshake and three-way session establishment. And if this session is a short session, say, I only have just two packets to send to you, you still have to go through this uh, set of overheads. Now, later in advanced material, we'll see quite a few more overheads, especially on mobility support, as well as on uh, local area network getting the correct MAC to IP address translation, getting the correct URL of the web, both carry a lot of overhead. And then in the homework problem, we also look at an open-ended question on security overhead associated with ensuring uh, the confidentiality and integrity of the data. And then obviously there are also headers. It's a kind of boring to show you all the details of different fields in the header. Uh, it is essential if you want to become a computer engineer uh, in charge of a network and mean, but uh, that's not the goal of this course. But suffice to say that there are many essential fields in a header. For example, if you're talking about layer three in the IP packet, the header includes things such as the source IP address, the destination IP address, the version of the IP is a V4, V6. All these are essential fields and they carry anywhere from a couple of bits of overhead to say you know, 32 bits of overhead. So you've got uh, tens of bytes of overhead just on the header for one layer. And then you have to go through all the other layers and they all add their own header. Okay, And then there are optional fields fields that are actually just often left empty, okay. but uh, it is important to have a consistent format just in case they're useful in the future. So they also add to the overhead in the header. And sometimes a protocol demands a packet to be fragmented, meaning you've got too long a packet for a variety of reasons. For example, in case this is lost, then you have to retransmit a lot. So they say, well, I would rather say, instead of adding just one header for this long packet, I'm going to have to break this into, say, three packets. Now, each one would need a header. So packet fragmentation uh, increases the proportion of headers relative to the actual payload, the useful information of the packet. And beyond protocol semantics and header, there's also the control plane signaling. 
what is the control plane? We've been mostly talking about the so-called data plane. The visualization is that there's a plane and there are a lot of pipes, channels, okay, end to end, for example, and then they transmit the actual data. And then beneath that, okay, vertically, there's another plane called the control plane. There are also a lot of bits flying around, okay, hop by hop, end to end, but they are not carrying the actual payload at all. Okay? Not only is adding a header to the payload, there is no payload anyway. What you are sending are the control signals. So here are two analogies. One analogy is Netflix. I think we briefly mentioned this earlier in some lecture. When you go online, okay, you put some DVDs on your queue. That is the control plane. Okay? And it's done over the internet. Then when you actually get the DVD, that is the data plane. And that is through the, say, US Postal Service. It's a completely different network. Another analogy is the uh, airport flight control. Okay. The controller will be calling different people, for example, calling the uh, pilot. That is the control plane. And it's done through some kind of telephone system. And you may say that, please take off, please, please land. And the actual payload, which are, say, cargoes or human beings, are the uh, ones that's flying through the data plane. And the data plane is actually done over the air through an airplane. So clearly, the telephone network and the airplane network are very different. So similarly, in communication networks, there's a control plane, there's a data plane. And control plane has many different kinds of channels. If you care to read, say, 3GPP standardization spec, you will see uh, three layers of taxonomy of channels, okay? not the protocol layer that we've been talking about. And you will see that there are tons, okay, uh, more than 30 different kinds of channels. Quite a bit of them are actually control channels. For example, carrying the control message of what transmit power that you should be using. It's actually very tricky to size these control channels. If they're size too big, then you are wasting uh, your pipe. Right? You're dividing a big chunk of your pipe to send these control signals, and it turns out you don't need that much. But if they are size too small, then it would take too long to finish transmitting these control signals. And then that will introduce the delay to your throughput formula, and that's not good either. So you face a very tricky balance between too big and too small control channels. And what do these control plane channels do? They actually have many important functionalities, usually classified into five groups. One is performance monitoring, okay, just to make sure what is the throughput you're getting, for example. One is configuration. Again, in advanced material, we'll talk about a mobility support where we'll talk about um, address configuration. Okay. Then there's also billing and charging. A lot of what we talked about uh, in lecture 11 uh, and 12, smart data pricing, usage pricing, are traditionally done inside the network with these uh, particular servers and software are running the billing and charging services. Uh, in fact, there is something called uh, CDR, which is a record of the uh, billing and charging that costs a tremendous amount of money to maintain and operate by an ISP. Okay. And then there's also billing and charging, not facing the consumers, customers, but across in between the ISPs. Then there's also fault management, okay, to make sure that if there's something that goes wrong, you can quickly detect contain and then repair it. For example, if one IP router breaks down, you'll be able to find alternative path to go around it. And that requires monitoring and management. And then of course, security and privacy, things such as authentications and logins, all that. So as you can see, the uh, amount of functionalities involved here is actually very important.
without these, you can just have the data plane. So now let's get back to our answer question and try to answer it. The question again is, uh, what is the speed, the useful throughput application layer that I can expect? And the answer actually depends on four different factors. So in other words, you've got one questions, one question, but four kinds of answers.